This is part two of our lesson on the relationship between consumption and urbanization. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about Peru and uh, look at the Peruvian coast. Um, and that will lead into parts three and part four. So this is a map of Peru. On it, you can see three different colors. The yellow is the coast, the brown is the uh, area encompassed by the Andes, and the green is the uh, Amazon rainforest. If you talk to a Peruvian school child and ask them to tell you about Peru, they're going to say that Peru has three regions, the coast, the highlands, and the jungle. It's sort of their Pledge of Allegiance almost. Uh, these three regions dictate a lot about uh, Peruvian history, but recently uh, historians and uh, academics have started to talk about a fourth region, and that's the uh, region to the west of the coast, Peru's ocean. Peru has one of the most biodiverse and uh, richest coastal regions in the world uh, and we'll explain why that is in the next few slides but the Peruvian coast has been the place where a lot of Peru's wealth has come from uh, and uh, it's a really fascinating story okay so the Peruvian coast has a few uh, fe geological oceanographic features that make it unique. One is uh, the Humboldt Current. Uh, this is a couple of currents that run along the coast. You can see here uh, on the screen there are a picture of the cold water hugging the coast. The, that cold water is nutrient rich uh, which means uh, it's really uh, has high levels of uh, phytoplankton and other small uh, animals. Uh, so the cold water is uh, good for uh, spawning fish and uh, the growth of schools of fish. We also have uh, what's called a coastal upwelling. There's only five coastal upwellings in the world uh, and those five upwellings are the best fishing grounds in the world. So an upwelling brings nutrient-rich waters from below the surface, uh, deep down, uh, up to the surface. Uh, and the nutrients that uh, are brought up uh, become phytoplankton, which is then consumed by the species at the bottom of the food chain. And so the abundance of the species at the bottom of the food chain means that there's a lot of species at the top. So in the case of the Peruvian uh, aquatic ecosystem, that means either the anchovy or uh, sardines but mostly anchovies okay so here we see another vision of the uh, Pacific Ocean in normal uh, temperatures and uh, you see the cold upwelling on the eastern part the right part of the screen uh, and the, the direction of the coastal winds circulating from South America along the equator uh, over to Australia uh, so in the Normal conditions, the Pacific Ocean is uh, very rich in terms of fish there on the uh, eastern coast. However, uh, Peru also uh, is home to El Nino, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. This was a phenomenon first described by uh, Peruvian fishermen in the late 19th century, even though it's a phenomenon that's going on for quite a long. El Nino refers to the El Niño Jesús, the Christ child. Uh, and uh, this is when those conditions are reversed. So instead of uh, the uh, cold water coming up from the bottom of the, of the coast and uh, the air and uh, currents circulating from uh, east to west, that's reversed and the warm water of the western Pacific uh, makes its way along the equator to the Eastern Pacific to the uh, coast of South America. 
this leads to uh, global changes. Uh, it becomes warm uh, in areas where it's cold. Uh, the Proven Coast is very dry. It becomes very rainy. Uh, the winters in Russia become even colder. The summers in Ethiopia and China and India become drier and more prone to drought. Uh, we'll talk more about this in upcoming lectures. So Peru has a unique series of oceanographic features along its coast that provide it with the conditions to have thousands of different types of fish uh, in abundant quantities, right? Including sharks, shrimp, lobster, giant squid, tuna, sardines, but most importantly, anchovies. Uh, the anchovies off the Proving Coast are the Engrowlis ringens. They are about eight inches long on average and have been along the Proving Coast for centuries. Records dating back to the Incas have uh, the presence of uh, anchovies. They were the foodstuff that gave Peru its first uh, boom as an independent nation in the 19th century between about 1840 and 1880. Uh, Peru was home to a guano boom. So guano is the Quechua word for manure and uh, it refers to the literally millennia of bird shit that built up on the islands off the coast of Peru. So because it hardly rains along the Peruvian coast and the abundance of fish from the upwelling and the cold currents, there was uh, a large seabird population. These seabirds ate the fish, uh, defecated, and uh, because it never rains, that uh, defecation never washed away. So in the picture on the right, uh, we see one of these islands with uh, the installation. This is a picture from the Paracas Nature Reserve in uh, just south of Lima. Uh, this was a major guano area uh, 250 years ago. On the left is a picture of a guano mountain and the sort of dark figures there are probably the uh, Chinese workers that these guano companies imported in the 1850s and 1860s to mine the mountains of really bird shit. That is a 60 to 100 foot tall mountain of uh, you know centuries old bird shit. Uh, all of this was uh, packed up uh, and shipped to England where it became the fuel for the English country garden so typical of Victorian England. Some historians have tied the rise of population in uh, Europe in the 19th century to the improvements made in agriculture due to the use of guano uh, over the course of the century. It, the guano ran out in the 1880s and that's a whole other story that we don't have uh, time for today uh, but the, there was a product that replaced it made from those same fish that teamed off the shore and that was fish meal. So fish meal is basically like oatmeal is ground up oats. Fish meal is ground up fish. It's an additive for animal feeds, particularly for chicken uh, and pig feed and increasingly in recent years other uh, feed for other fish. Um, fish meal has been around for uh, quite a long time. Essentially prior to 1950 fish meal was made from the remnants of uh, the canning process or the any sort of production process, the heads and the tails and the guts. After 1950, uh, fish meal has been made from whole fish. Uh, the uh, farmers around the world have found that by adding about 10% of fish meal to their pig, chicken or fish feed can have dramatic results in animal growth. Fish meal allows a animal to get bigger more quickly and get to the market more quickly. Uh, 
for less money and less feed. So essentially, uh, what we see is uh, fish meal plants pop up around the globe, but in no place more than in Peru. Over the course of the 50s and the 60s, in Peru, they built over 100 fish meal plants all along the coast. Uh, the fish meal production uh, is rather simple. Uh, a boat drops off fish. The fish uh, is uh, first cooked and then pressed. Uh, from the pressing, uh, the oil is separated and the solids are uh, refined and ground. Uh, the, uh, the solids are then uh, bagged up as fish meal. The liquids uh, become fish oil. Uh, but also there's a lot of uh, blood and um, water that's included and there is a uh, process to reprocess that water uh, unfortunately for many Peruvian fisheries that reprocessing didn't happen until quite recently okay so these large fish meal plants popped up all over the place uh, and uh, well we'll talk about them as we go through the lecture So fish meal was consumed throughout the world, China, the United States, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Uh, and if you look at this chart, it becomes rather obvious why it had such an important role. Uh, in 1935, to get a 2.8 pound chicken uh, to market, it would take 112 days and take about four pounds of feed for each pound of meat. Uh, by 1995, it took uh, 47 days to get a 4.7 pound bird to market using just 1.9 pounds of feed. The addition of fish meal coming around 1945 to 1955 uh, really altered the productive ratio. There's other reasons why uh, there were better um, breeding techniques, better raising te uh, techniques, but uh, fish meal is a really important uh, factor in this. So the use of fish meal uh, after 1950 uh, sparks the fishing industry in Peru. Industrialists realize that the massive schools of anchovies off the Peruvian coast can be turned directly into fish meal. And we start to see major investment come from not only Peruvian companies, uh, but also international companies all throughout Peru, all up and down the coast. Uh, Peru goes from being about 17th in the world in terms of uh, major fishing nations during World War II to number one by 1963. Just a massive, uh, massive uh, growth. And you can see the light blue line uh, is uh, Peru's ascent and its sharp decline. And we'll talk about that sharp decline uh, in a few minutes, right? It surpasses China and Japan as a world's leading fishing nation. This was a proud moment for Peru who uh, could claim being number one in something uh, that is not something they are able to do uh, very often and uh, it also was uh, very proud for the uh, residents of Chimbote the country's largest fishing port and indeed the largest fishing port in the world uh, more fish was landed in Chimbote in the 1960s than anywhere else in the world however the Peruvian fish meal industry uh, didn't uh, developed too um, rationally. Uh, you can see two lines here. The blue line is the total catch of fish in Peru. The red line is the total catch of anchovies. And uh, they were pretty much the same, right? So Peruvian fishermen basically extracted one species of fish to the exclusion of all the others. They extracted the fish that not only ate the phytoplankton, a, you know, um, a micronutrient that larger fish can eat, but they also were the fish that the larger fish, like the tunas and the mackerels and the giant squid, ate. So they eliminated the crucial layer in the food chain. And this is going to become a massive problem later down the road. Okay, we're going to look at a uh, video about uh, fish meal production and chimbote, and then we'll turn our uh, focus on chimbote in the fourth part of the lecture.